Happy Sunday morning, boys and girls. It's your old pal Andy France, the grand poobah of Judson Sunday School. Welcome back to another episode of Virtual Judson Sunday School. You know, in preparing for today's lesson, I wanted to find out where the word no ranks on a list of the most disliked words. Uh, seems to me it ought to be on that list somewhere, doesn't it? So I went searching over the interwebs this week, and the next thing I knew, I had fallen down an enormous rabbit hole called word aversion. Have you ever heard of word aversion? Aversion, spelled A-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, means a strong dislike for something. And so word aversion would mean a strong dislike for certain words. Now, it turns out that different people dislike different words for different reasons. It could be that um, some people associate a particular word with something particularly creepy or disgusting. Or it might be that they associate another word with a bad memory, something painful in their past or whatever. Or it could be that the word is just hard or weird to say. Now, one thing about this word aversion list, these disliked words need not be offensive. It, they don't have to be a curse word to be on the list or to be um, a word that would demean another person. In fact, when it comes to word aversion, we're usually talking about normal, everyday words that for some reason drive people up the wall. Now, I would guess that on any list of words that kids dislike, you might have one of the following. Let's see, homework, chores, bedtime, timeout, school, or whatever words are on this week's vocabulary test, right? And besides the word pandemic, I would guess that the number one word or most disliked word these days by kids and parents alike is probably what? Zoom. But it turns out that none of these words are on the list. Um, would you care to guess what the number one most disliked word is? I'll tell you. It's moist. Moist, spelled M-O-I-S-T. People hate that word. In a recent survey, 60% of the respondents called moist the grossest word ever. The grossest word ever? Are you kidding me? Look, I don't want to brag or anything, but, you know, I know some pretty gross words, and the word moist wouldn't be anywhere near the top of my list. And besides, if we get rid of the word moist, how will we ever compliment someone on their cake? And I like cake. But apparently, six out of 10 people hear the word moist like they hear fingernails scraping across a chalkboard. So, for you six people out there, I will refrain from saying the word anymore in this episode. Some of the other disliked words on the list, I understand. Phlegm. Ugh. Phlegm is on the list. You know what phlegm is, right? It's that thick mucus that is secreted um, in your respiratory passages and comes out your mouth. Also known as hocking a loogie. <laughs> Now you know what it is, right? So, phlegm made the list. And I would put phlegm on my list, too, simply because of the way it looks on the page. It's spelled P-H-L-E-G-M. Ugh. It just looks bad. Also on that list is the word mucus and the word loogie. Ointment made the list, perhaps because of its association with a painful cut or a scrape or something like that. Or maybe it's just the way the word sounds, oint. Oint, oint, oint. Sounds like we're a bunch of pigs, doesn't it? The word curd made the list. You know what curd is? It's that uh, when milk sours or uh, sort of coagulates, 
It's the basis for cheese. And so curd made the list, as did curdle and coagulate. Here are a few more words on the list. Seepage, boogers, yolk, maggots, goiter, which is an enlargement of the thyroid, eh, swollen neck, just for what it's worth. Um, what else? Giblets, or is it giblets? Ah, I don't cook. What do I know? Um, pantyhose made the list. I'm afraid that word would be on my list, too. I don't know why. It just kind of creeps me out. Uh, rural made the list. Do you know what the word rural means? It's spelled R-U-R-A-L. Um, it's, you know, like in the country as opposed to urban in the city. Rural is out in the country. I think it made the list just because it's hard to say. Rural. Say it with me. Rural. Rural. Another word that made the list is dollop. Dollop is a shapeless blob of something soft, like dip or cottage cheese or sour cream. Someone said that every time they say the word dollop, they sound like they're trying to swallow their lips. Dollop. Just a couple more. Trump made the list. No explanation necessary there. Um, the word tofu made the list. I would put tofu on my list of disliked words, too. I'm not a big fan of tofu. And finally, last but not least, zwieback. You know that toasted uh, bread that children, little babies, teeth on that uh, you know, they eat? I think that made the list just because of that visual image of a drooling, teething baby with all that brown bread all over their mouth. Anyway. Those are some of the words on the word aversion list. And like I said earlier, I originally went looking to see where the word no fits on any kind of list or ranks on any kind of list of disliked words. After all, no is the ultimate negative word. No one likes to hear the word no, and we've been hearing the word no since we were toddlers, right? We don't like to be told no. We don't like to be told we can't do something. We want to be told yes. We want to do what we want to do. And yet, doesn't it sometimes feel as if whoever's in charge, our parents or our teachers or whoever it might be, are not listening to us so much. They're just saying no like they're pressing a button, like it's automatic. For example, hey mom, will you buy me that video game? Can we go to the park today? No, no, no! What do you say, just for tonight, let's have dessert first? For the last time, no. You want to skip school? No. I think our goldfish is bored. How about if we pour some food coloring into its water, just to shake things up a little bit? No. Hey, Dad. Just for a change, how about letting me drive for once? No! Andy, can we climb on the roof of the playhouse at church? No! Would it be okay if I fart into my baby sister's pillow? No! Doesn't today feel like a good day to shave our heads? No! I'm thinking of changing my name. From now on, call me Mr. Butt Cheeks McGee. Could I put the cat in the dishwasher just to see what happens? For the last time, no. How about if I put the dog in the dryer? No, no, no. Well, could I? No. How about if I? No. Would you? No. No, 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 no. Look, there are many reasons why being told no is a good thing, a legitimate thing, for reasons of personal safety or the safety of others. Hearing no might not be the worst thing in the world. And also, not everything we do is age appropriate. Sometimes a no today could turn into a yes down the road. Our parents have to sort of be, um, they have to sort of take the long view. And okay, there are instances when the word no is questionable. Sometimes our parents or those in authority are just too exhausted to say yes. 
they are worn down and preoccupied with the pressures of work or finances or the pandemic. And let's face it, some of your questions can be a little goofy. Can I put the cat in the dishwasher, please? But there are instances where hearing the word no is not legitimate. Anytime people are denied their basic human rights, when people are told no because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or because of their sexual orientation, the fact that they might be straight or gay or bisexual, anytime someone is told no for any of those reasons, well, that's just plain wrong. And that no has to go. The month of March is also known as Women's History Month. And even though today is the last Sunday in February, I thought we would give ourselves a head start on studying women's history. So today and over the next few weeks, we are going to learn about women and girls who were told no sometime in their life, if not repeatedly, simply because of their sex. But they refused to take the word no uh, for a final answer. Um, and so being told no, uh, oh goodness gracious, I think that's a lesson for any of us, um, no matter what our gender is, that we don't have to take uh, no for a final answer. We have two stories to read today, the first of which is called uh, The Ambitious Girl. Ambitious just happens to be our word of the day. I bet you thought the word of the day was going to be no, didn't you? Ambitious means having a strong desire to do something or to achieve something typically involving hard work and determination. Now, we talked about determination earlier this month when we were learning about Nelson Mandela and all of those freedom songs. Do you remember? Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. That's determination. It's a firmness of purpose. It's having the focus you need to get something done. Well, an ambitious person has determination. An ambitious person aspires to rise above their limitations. An ambitious person keeps their eye on the prize, always striving to reach their goal. An ambitious person doesn't give up. No. An ambitious person doesn't take no for an answer. That's a firm maybe. An ambitious person says no to no. Yes, baby. Well, yes. Well, kids, as I said earlier, our first story is called Ambitious Girl. It's by Mina Harris and Marissa Valdez. Hmm. Mina Harris. Harris. Hmm. Does that name sound familiar to you by any chance? It could be because Mina Harris is the niece of Vice President Kamala Harris, which means that she is the daughter of uh, Kamala's sister, Maya. So let's read Ambitious Girl. And we open up here with no words, just our young girl here staring at a bunch of televisions with a politician, a woman a politician speaking. Oh, and then we see a bunch of TVs, commentary about this woman politician, and the words are too assertive, too persistent, too ambitious, too loud, too confident, too ambitious, too proud. But then we hear what this woman is saying. Don't let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. That sounds kind of important. Maybe I'll repeat that. Don't let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. 
When I grow up, I hope to be all the things I can see in a world that's changing fast and slow, a world I'm only beginning to know. I want to go, go, go out the gate, but sometimes all I hear is, wait. And if I try to resist, it's, you're to that or you're to this. Those words may try to dim my light. But mommy says the words passed down can build me up to new heights. Standing tall like a soaring tower, I am valued, I am loved. I have purpose, hope, and power. Ahead of me, sisters, aunties, mothers have opened so many doors. Grandma says, you may be the first someday, but don't be the last. Make space for more. I hope you can see these pictures, kids. We have some women suffragettes. These were the women who demonstrated for the right to vote, uh, which uh, was given to women, or I guess earned by women, about 100 years ago. We have a bumper sticker, it looks like, for Chisholm. Vote Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, Shirley Chisholm. She'll pop up in our second story. Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman to run for the presidency back in 1972. And then we have a picture of an astronaut. This is Mae Jemison, who was the first African-American uh, female astronaut. Uh, she was uh, one of the astronauts on board the uh, space shuttle, the Endeavor. No one can tell me who I am or who I'm meant to be. Auntie says, what has always been is all they're able to see. I'll take my time and claim my place and show the world this is me. Persistent means I won't give up. Assertive means I won't back down. Confident means I believe in me. Proud means I cheer for us the world around. Ambitious means all of that and more. I have goals, but I'm not keeping score. Ambitious girls, we get things done. If life's a race, we're ready to run. If we fall, we get back up. And if we fail, it's a chance to disrupt. No to that or to this will stop what's inside us from flowering. From now on, when I hear to that or to this, I won't mind. It's empowering. I'll take up space. I'll shout if I please. I'll laugh and I'll play and I'll jump at the sun. I'll wear the words thrown at me and I won't take no from anyone. I am not afraid to make some noise. I'm more than ready to use my voice. Because there's no to that or to this when it comes to being ambitious. Ambitious girl. So kids, next month we're going to branch out musically just a bit and try a new song. But for today, we will stick with Tom Waits and Little Trip to Heaven. So if you've got your music ready, either your lyrics or your picture lyrics, let's see how we do this week. Are you ready? Here we go. From the top. One, two, three. Ready, sing. Little trip to heaven on the wings of your love. Banana moon is shining in the sky. I feel like I'm in heaven when you're with me. I know that I'm in heaven 
when you smile. Though we're stuck here on the ground, I got something that I found, and it's you. One, two, sing. I don't have to take no trip to outer space. Turn the page. All I have to do is look at your face. And before I know it, I'm in orbit around you. Thanking my lucky stars that I found you. When I see your constellation, honey, you're my inspiration, and it's you. One, two, sing. You're my north star when I'm lost and feeling blue. The sun is breaking through the clouds, don't you know it's true? Honey, all the other stars seem dim around you. Thanking my lucky stars that I found you. When I see your smiling face, honey, I know nothing's going to take your place. And it's you, 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 and it's you. Shubiru papara. I'm sure you did a great job. Thank you so much for singing with me today. Well, kids, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there was a little history made uh, last month around these parts. No big deal, really. Just the uh, swearing in of the first female vice president in the 245-year history of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. So good of Kamala to join us today. I thought I would read us a story about Kamala. We can hear a little bit about her ambition growing up um, and just find out more about uh, what makes her tick and see if that might be an inspiration to all of us as we're starting our own Women's History Month. So let's read Kamala Harris, Rooted in Justice by Nikki Grimes and Laura Freeman. Life is a story you write day by day. Kamala's begins with a name that means lotus flower. See how her beautiful smile opens wide like petals fanning across the water's surface. But you don't see the flower's roots, her roots. They grow deep, deep, deep down. Let me show you. Kamala's family line was a strong black and brown braid coiling from India, where her mother Shamala was born, to Jamaica, where her father Donald was born, to Berkeley, California, where her parents fell in love and married, to Oakland, where Kamala was born. It was a good beginning. Right away, Kamala was like clay her parents molded for action. When her mother wasn't hunting cures for cancer and her father wasn't teaching, both marched for civil rights and went to lectures by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Kamala was right there too, bouncing along in her stroller, chewing on her pacifier and words like peace and justice. Once, when tiny Kamala was fussing, her mother couldn't figure out what was the matter. What do you want, little girl, she asked. Freedom, said Kamala, and a waterfall of laughter sputtered from her mother's mouth. At demonstrations, marchers often chanted, what do we want? And the answer was always, freedom. Little Kamala had been listening. Kamala's baby sister, Maya, screamed her way into the world when Kamala was two. In no time, the sisters were having faraway adventures together, like visiting their grandparents in Zambia. Grandfather P. V. Gopalan was a senior diplomat there. He had once fought for India's independence. His wife Rajam, Kamala's grandmother, fought for the rights of women. Little by little, on these visits, 
Kamala and Maya learned that fighting for justice ran in the family. Sadly, when Kamala was seven, her family squeezed into a different shape. Her parents divorced, and her daddy, and Ma and her daddy moved to Palo Alto, while Mommy and the girls packed for the flatlands, the black working-class area in Berkeley. Having a long-distance daddy can make your heart hurt. But Kamala's new neighbors welcomed her family with smiles and helping hands, warm as sunshine. Still, Kamala was sometimes lonely for her daddy. Luckily, her godmother, Aunt Mary, lived close by and gave Kamala extra hugs whenever she needed them. Like other black and brown kids in the flatlands, Kamala was part of a California program to integrate the schools. Every day she rode a yellow bus, bumping through familiar city streets all the way to the wealthy white part of town with sprawling hillsides painted with gardens. Thousand Oaks Elementary was a world away, but Kamala didn't mind. There she got to meet kids who were rich and poor, black and white, kids who celebrated holidays she'd never even heard of. There, teachers taught her to count to ten in many different languages. School let out before Mrs. Harris got home, so Kamala and Maya spent the afternoons at the Shelton house two doors down, where Mrs. Regina Shelton ran daycare and after-school programs with posters on the wall of Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and Harriet Tubman. Mrs. Shelton was a second mother to Kamala, always encouraging her to have confidence. Once, Mrs. Shelton bit into a lemon bar Kamala had made all by herself, accidentally using salt instead of sugar. Oh, delicious, said Mrs. Shelton. Maybe a little too much salt, but really delicious, she said, never pointing out Kamala's total failure. That day, Mrs. Shelton let Kamala walk away, feeling successful, feeling like she could do anything. After school, Kamala's days bulged with busyness. She had homework, piano lessons, ballet classes, and Barbie playtime. Thursday nights were the best, though. The family would go to the Rainbow Sign, a cultural center celebrating black art, music, books, and film. James Baldwin spoke there, Maya Angelou read there, and Nina Simone sang there. Nina's gravelly-voiced version of To Be Young, Gifted, and Black often rang through Kamala's home. The more she heard this favorite song, the more Kamala thought, I'm young, gifted, and black too. On Sundays, when they weren't visiting their father, Kamala and Maya rocked from side to side at the 23rd Avenue Church of God, where they tapped tambourines and sang as part of the children's choir, Fill My Cup, Lord. That was Kamala's favorite hymn. The church was where she learned the Bible, that God asks us to speak up for those who can't defend the rights of the poor and needy, like some lawyers do. Her uncle Sherman was that kind of lawyer. Maybe someday Kamala could be one too. In her first year of middle school, Kamala would need a lot of faith. She learned a new lesson about change, a lesson dressed in down jackets and mittens, her family was moving north, where 12 feet of snow and her mother's new job waited in Montreal. It will be a wonderful adventure, Shamala told her girls. But Kamala grumbled. The thought of leaving her friends and the warmth of sunny California made her shiver. It was February, and Montreal robed in winter's sparkling white felt like it had ice in its veins. Kamala couldn't stop shivering. Worse yet, their new neighbor spoke French, a language Kamala's mother insisted her daughters learn. The English name of the French school her mother handpicked for them was Our Lady of the Snows. Montreal was no place for a lotus flower. Sighing, Kamala unpacked her new clothes and her old experiences, like marching for change with her mom. One spring day, when the temperature rose enough for outdoor sports,
Kamala and Maya marched in front of their apartment building waving picket signs because kids weren't allowed to play soccer on the front lawn. It wasn't fair, and Kamala cared a lot about fairness. The building manager read Kamala and Maya's signs and changed the rules. Kamala adjusted to life in Canada, but memories of her home country still rang in her heart like a bell. After graduating high school, she ached to return to America, where her parents had nursed her on the civil rights movement. She couldn't wait to follow in the footsteps of her heroes, Constance Baker Motley, Charles Hamilton Houston, and Thurgood Marshall. Marshall had attended Howard University, and Kamala decided she would too. On her first day at Howard, Kamala turned this way and that, smiling at the faces of students from America, Africa, the Caribbean. It was Thursday nights at the rainbow sign all over again, where everyone in the room was black like her. They reminded her of home and the people she wanted to help, the people she wanted to fight for. The university would begin to teach her how. Howard seemed like a perfect place to run her very first campaign. It was for class representative of the Liberal Arts Student Council. Her competition was tough, but so was Kamala. Every day between classes, she passed out flyers in the campus yard and told any students who'd listen why they should vote for her. When the last ballot was counted, Kamala came out the winner. Kamala's time at Howard was focused on the future. She competed on the debate team to sharpen her speaking skills. She interned at the Federal Trade Commission. She did research at the National Archives to study the workings of government. And on weekends, she joined fellow students on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to protest apartheid in South Africa. Kamala was preparing to be a woman warrior. Nothing matched the magic of her second summer break when Kamala stepped through the doors of the private Senate subway as an intern for Senator Alan Cranston. Kamala couldn't bear, could barely hold in the secret of her joy. What could be better than learning from someone whose footsteps echoed in the halls of power every day? After Howard, California called Kamala home to study at Hastings College of the Law. Court cases and contracts filled Kamala's mind, but changing lives filled her heart. Elected president of the Black Law Students Association, Kamala invited major law firms to a job fair so that more black graduates had a fair chance to be hired by the best companies in the country. This work was great practice for Kamala's future. Graduating law school meant there was one more exam to take, the California bar. Without passing it, Kamala could not practice the law. She didn't pass, which taught Kamala something new, failure. It is the toughest teacher, but it could also be the best because it makes you dig down deep and try harder. On the second try, Kamala passed. Kamala was finally ready to climb the mountain of her dreams. First, deputy district attorney. Next, the first female district attorney of San Francisco. Then, the first black woman attorney general of California. Peak by peak, she rose, eventually becoming the second black woman voted into the U.S. Senate. Lawyer, prosecutor, senator. The little girl named Lotus Flower had turned herself into a person others could call on for help. As senator, Kamala fought for laws to help workers earn more money, joined the Women's March on Washington for Equality and Civil Rights, and telephoned lawyers to help immigrant children who came to America looking for someplace safe to live. Each time she answered a call for help, 
Kamala proved that her family's legacy of public service was alive and well in her. Kamala had traveled far, but she hadn't finished climbing the mountain of her dreams. On Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, on the TV show Good Morning America, Kamala told the world, I'm running for President of the United States. She immediately got goosebumps, wondering if Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to run for president, was smiling down from heaven that very moment. Months into the race, Kamala realized that running for president cost money, more money than she thought, and Kamala's campaign team didn't have enough. She decided to give up her run for the 2020 presidential nomination. The senator's sadness lifted, though, when a soft-spoken man named Joe invited her to be his running mate, and after a hard-fought campaign, Kamala won an historic new name, Madam Vice President. Will Donald and Shamala's daughter get to be president herself someday? Only God knows. Kamala Harris is still writing her American story. Kamala Harris, rooted in justice. Well, boys and girls, it looks like we've done it again. We've somehow managed to get through yet another episode of Virtual Judson Sunday School. No! Yes, I believe we did. So as always, I want to thank Andre and Michelle for all their help putting this episode together. I want to thank you for being with me today as well. And so until we get together again, I hope that you have a great week, that you are staying safe these days, doubling up on those masks, I hope. Um, keep a place for this place in your heart. I heard those angels behind me complaining, where are all the kids? So remember, Judson, if you will. And until next time, I'll see you then on Virtual Judson Sunday School. Yes. <laughs>